Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, first remark is the the principle um, at the outset is a legal principle. So it's a matter. It's a legal matter. Uh, so I imagine that uh, the purpose of my talk uh, will be try to explain uh, the manner in which uh, that principle unfolds uh, in different legal orders. Uh, second remark, uh, ever since its inception, uh, the principle has been adopted by controversies uh, with, on the one hand, uh, supporters, uh, mostly among uh, environmentalists or health advocates, and on the other hand, um, mostly business lawyers or um, a part of the uh, academic establishment. Um, as a matter of course, I brought them to the first group, so I'm far from being neutral on the matter. But nevertheless, um, it seems to me that uh, the debate has been ideologically based, in particular among the opponents, and uh, I've always been endorsing a strict positive approach, a strict positivist uh, analysis. So I, I would try to uh, summarize complex uh, legal controversies uh, that have been uh, precluding the principle to uh, deliver uh, all its expected uh, effects. So my um, thesis uh, is that uh, there is much ideology uh, impeaching the principles uh, to um, uh, empower administrations uh, to endorse a proper course of action. The principle is a main challenge uh, to traditional legal systems, uh, most of which are permeated by the ID or the notion of certainty. So, be it a German administrative law, be it a French administrative law, uh, be it tort law, be it civil law, uh, the tenet of legal system is that um, the evidence must be subject to no doubt whatsoever. So you imagine that uh, for academics, for scholars, for courts, uh, for the legal establishment, the principle is a challenge in its own right, in the account that it's putting forward, it's shedding light on the notion of uncertainty, that's an unacceptable notion, be it in the civil law or the public law sphere. So according, that's a gross summary of the oppositions. There have been a number of books, in particular in North America, uh, in the USA, but also in Europe, uh, contending uh, with the, the fact that uh, the particular principle could be considered as a legal principle. Um, it's, uh, this Criticism is broad on the account that it encompasses other principles like pollute based principles or preventive principles. And according to these critics, these principles are valueless in the legal sphere. They, they are just guiding, political guidance, uh, in channeling the regulatory actions. And so, without specific uh, legal or administrative arrangement, um, that are providing or supporting dynamic principles, they are lacking this autonomous applicability. So, uh, concretely speaking, you can do nothing in court. You cannot invoke these principles of court. So, you imagine that uh, NGOs uh, opposing a dam, opposing a nuclear plant, are trying to buttress their cases uh, on the violation, not exclusively of uh, particular administrative standards. Of procedures, but also on the infringement of constitutional right to a clean environment or the breach of precaution. So, if the lawmaker decides to give up and not to flesh out uh, the principle into more specific arrangements, uh, litigants could not invoke them before courts, and courts cannot uh, apply them in order to resolve the case. 
Uh, and, and this is really the, the key issue, this is whether the principle is worthless, and just political guidance at the level of the administration, or whether it's a sword that can be involved in court litigation, and that could guide the court to strike the authorization granted uh, to a contribution project. So I will delve fairly briefly into a number of uh, issues that I contemplate to a great extent in uh, my forthcoming uh, edition of uh, Environmental Principles that I publish with Oxford University Press. Uh, first issue, what's a principle from a legal perspective? Um, well, uh, second issue is that the legal world, unlike the scientific world, is utterly divided between two main families, common law and civil law. Uh, what's a customary rule at international level? Uh, is the pressure in principle uh, inapplicable because it's too vague? Um, is there an issue to uh, lift up the principle at the level of constitutions and to place it at the apex of the uh, legal hierarchy? Is precaution an obligation to act or just the faculty left to the regulator to intervene? And the question of the burden of proof. However, I will have to be quite short on this issue, but I can come back into discussion. So a principle from a legal perspective, it's a very polysimous notion. Um, many textbooks for students in law are called principles of civil law, principles of criminal law. Uh, so these principles are merely descriptive, uh, and that's not related to precaution. Um, principles are also uh, used to designate the fundamental legal norms, uh, like equity, concept of justice, they can be qualified as principles. This is not a case of precaution. However, principles are also have been created by courts, they have been putting forward by lawmakers in order to fill the gaps in positive law, um, in order to add a new source in a chaotic legal world. And my uh, thesis, or the thesis that I've been defending, is that uh, the principle of precaution can be uh, considered, a bit in Euro, a bit in general law, as a general principle of law. So imagine that a bunch of other lawyers utterly disagree with me. But I will try to make a case. So we, we live in a fairly divided world. On the one hand, uh, common law, encompassing, of course, for the English history, countries like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, uh, USA, England, Ireland, and most of the uh, other, the rest of the world pertains to the Romano Germanic or the civil uh, family. And the, the approach are quite different because in common law, the uh, notion of principle uh, is used with respect to equity, to statutory interpretation, and you have even the principles of common law in its own right. So there, there is no environmental principle in this realm of common law principles, so to speak. However, in the civil law, so be it in Germany, be it in France, uh, courts like the Court of Cassation, Council of States, uh, Supreme Administrative Courts, uh, Constitutional Courts, have been shaping, they have been holding their own principles in order to fill the gaps in the constitutions and the legislation, and in order to strike, be it legislation, be it regulations, be it administrative decision, on the account that they are in breach of a major legal rule created by the court. And my claim is that um, the, uh, there is a new generation of principles called the directing principles that are quite are more, much more acquainted to the civil law tradition than the common law tradition. And that explains why many American lawyers are quite opposed to uh, precaution on the account that it has, uh, it's a notion they are not really acquainted, uh, in addition to maybe an ideological uh, history uh, regarding the, the risk that precaution will uh, uh, deliver too much power to the regulators. Um, other issue is it an approach or a principle um, the US government has been quite keen in defending in um, diplomatic circles that it's merely an approach 
uh, approach is a political uh, concept that does not uh, have any uh, legal effect uh, for uh, European lawyers. Uh, the principle is actually correctly called a principle on the account that it has it is to be there to in order to uh, deliver uh, principles. So many legal acts are confused about the matter. Uh, if I look at the field of uh, fisheries, uh, the EU framework regulations of fisheries and the United Nations um, agreement of uh, 1996 on the fisheries um, put forward the concept of approach to the detriment of the concept of principle. But look at the law of the sea and the different regional conventions, in particular in Europe, uh, there is no mention of approach, there is a mention of principle. But again, uh, in the clash between these two concepts, there are ideological considerations, so to speak. Then, big debate is precaution today a customary rule. So, in a natural customary rule, it's a rule developed by the Israel Court, like the Israel Court of Justice, uh, that's filling the gap uh, that's derived, extracted from a different uh, agreement, from uh, different traditions. And in order to create, um, uh, uh, to crystallize a rule into a customary principle, one need to fill two conditions. The first one, a repeated use of practice, of state practice, uh, which is quite challenging approach, and a consistent opinion yours. So the whole textbooks have been published, uh, PhD on the matter, authors claiming that both conditions have been fulfilled. In the 1990s, many authors have been considering that uh, so far there is not enough consistent state practice uh, in order to claim that precaution has been crystallized in a customary rule. So why does it matter? It matters, of course, from a legal point of view, on the account that the principle of precaution has been enshrined in somewhat one of treaties, agreed, mostly environmental agreements. However, many states are not parties to these agreements, and in case one can claim that precaution is has to be considered as a customary rule, it means that the principle can apply to parties, that to, to states litigating before international courts, without the state being party to a specific environmental convention. That the, the rule is prevailing over statutory law. So it means that the rule, the customary rule, is filling the gap in the internal legal environment. Uh, so that's a huge consequence. It means that a country like Pakistan or like India could be bound by the principle, although the Supreme Court won't have been considering in the case law uh, precaution as a general principle. And this Countries are perhaps not parties to specific agreements in which the principle is enshrined. So, so far, the, the main cause, be it at WTO level or be it in Den Haag, at the level of the intra court of justice, have been extremely reluctant uh, to adumbrate the topic. So, it's too early to decide on the matter. We just leave that to the scholars uh, to crossword on the matter. However, lately, in Hamburg, uh, the Seabed Dispute Chamber of the Insurance Tribunal of the Law of the Sea has been handing down an opinion. It's not a, it's not a judgment, it's an opinion, uh, on the request of different Pacific states regarding the exploitation of the uh, nodules and sulfides uh, on the seabed of the Pacific. And the court is claiming that. Uh, though the uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, statements, uh, principle 15 on precaution, is not binding, uh, it is today an integral part of the general obligation of due diligence. And due diligence is related to prevention. So it's a huge step forward. It means that we are moving from preventing risk to anticipating risk. And prevention goes hand in hand with an obligation of due diligence on behalf of the states authorizing hazardous activities likely to have international impacts. And that's an obligation 
that's binding the states, although they are not parties to specific environmental agreements. In addition, they claim it's a contractual uh, obligation. So that means that there is a shift today. Um, another claim by the opponents of the precautions that it's not binding because it's so vague. Of course, it's vague if you compare the different definitions. On the one hand, OSPAR Convention, a very ambitious definitions, very pro environmentalist, I would say, and the uh, Rio de Janeiro Principle 15, much more cautious about precautions. If I compare uh, the different thresholds, uh, one can understand that. Uh, the United Nations uh, document is much more cautious than OSPAR conventions. However, my claim is that uh, the principle of law are usually, generally speaking, indeterminate. They don't uh, bring a specific answer uh, to the issues of GMOs, or the issues of nanotechnologies, of uh, chemistry, or fisheries. That has to be decided on a case by case approaches. And so the, the, the precaution is not more indeterminate than other general principles of law, and I have no shortage of illustrations. Constitutionalization, only one country succeeded so far, uh, thanks to Jacques uh, Chirac. Uh, it's uh, embedded in the charter, uh, the French charter uh, for the environment, although the um, approach is a bit uh, narrow, just uh, limited to environmental issues with a number of conditions. But that has a huge advantage for litigants on the account that a number of cases have been brought by uh, MPs before the Constitutional Court in Paris, claiming that the law is in breach of Article 5 of the Constitution. So one is moving from litigation before the Council of State or the Supreme Administrative Court at a much higher level. It's not only the administrative decision that's being challenged. Is the legislation itself on the account it's too precautionary or too little precautionary? Uh, obligation of faculty um, courts are somewhat careful. Uh, uh, this is the uh, landmark judgment of the uh, Court of Justice is that institution may take protective measures in the face of uncertainties. Uh, other judgments of, in Luxembourg of the Court of Justice uh, highlight that there is an obligation under some circumstances uh, to act to intervene. Uh, again, my interpretation is that the precaution cannot be analyzed from a legal perspective into clinical isolation. It doesn't make any sense. It has to be linked uh, under constitutional law to the uh, obligations uh, to uh, protect the environment, so be it in the German constitution, or the French constitution, or the Belgian constitution, or the Norwegian constitution, there are plenty of provisions. Uh, be it at the level of the treaty, the EU treaty, there are obligations to achieve a high level of the environmental protection, high level of the health protection, high level of consumer protection. So one has to uh, interpret um, the, the issue whether it's an obligation of faculty in light of a broader constitutional objective, be it at EU level or be it at national level. Um, main issue for lawyers, a uh, burden of proof. We just uh, discussed the issue with the uh, new nanotech uh, regulations. Um, so many American scholars have been utterly upset on the account that uh, there is likely to be a shift of the burden of proof, and that uh, the issue of uh, probatio diabolica, uh, with the support of the principal claim in dubio pro network. So it's a clash between the two concepts. Um, um, well, the, the fact of the matter is that there is an, an obviously an inequality of knowledge and power uh, between the applicants uh, to obtain access to uh, new markets, be it for technologies or be it for chemical substances. Or pesticides and regulators. So uh, from a genuine administrative legal point of view, it makes sense uh, to obligate the applicant uh, of a hazardous activity, of a hazardous substance, to demonstrate whether it is not or it is uh, harmless or harmful. So it makes sense, uh, again, from a constitutional perspective, to place the burden of proof at an administrative level upon the applicant. So from a European perspective, there is no difficulties with this. Uh, 
If one delves into the US statutes or the Canadian statutes, there is a fabulous gap. Uh, the burden of proof is placed not upon the applicant, but it's clearly being placed upon the regulator, which makes the issue much more complex to control or to manage uh, chemical substances in the USA. So, um, a, a case in point with uh, respect to the burden of proof is the uh, violence case law, that's a settled case law at the level of the Court of Justice of the European Union, is that the applicants wanting to carry out uh, activities likely to impinge upon the status of conservation of natural to the um, uh, site uh, as to demonstrate uh, that there is no more uncertainty uh, that the effect of this activity is likely to be banning um, in order to obtain the authorization. Conversely, it means that whenever the applicant doesn't succeed or the developer doesn't succeed to demonstrate that the activity is harmless, the administration cannot grant the authorization at issue. So, uh, but looking at another perspective, a burden of proof is also an issue for litigants to understand whether the uh, state applying for a case before the trial court uh, bears a burden of proof or just as a case prima facie and the defendant state has to bring the scientific proof to demonstrate that the activity at issue uh, is harmless as no uh, intentional uh, serious international impact. Um, two opposing views, the Indian Supreme Court at domestic level claiming that with respect to hazardous activities, the onus of proof is placed on the developer. The Israel Court of Justice regarding the uh, litigations uh, between uh, Argentina and Uruguay uh, with respect to the operation of the uh, uh, mill client uh, claim that uh, the friction approach that could be relevant in the application of the treaty between the two states does not operate a reversal of uh, the proof. Um, to end this, uh, one has to bear in mind that the principle cannot be analyzed from a legal perspective into clinical isolation. Uh, that principle belongs to a, a very complex uh, legal uh, sphere in which uh, the pre precaution has to become, be combined with other environmental principles, but has to also to abide by uh, other general principles of law, or principle of non-discrimination, principle of, uh, of proportionality and fundamental rights. So precaution cannot run um, against uh, fundamental rights or against non-discriminations. So I'm afraid that uh, the legal debate is not over yet. Um, and I imagine that uh, there is a cultural issue, so misunderstanding between lawyers pertaining to the common uh, law uh, tradition and the lawyers, the European lawyers uh, much more embedded, or the South American lawyers much more embedded in the uh, civil legal uh, tradition. And that explains uh, why uh, there has been so uh, much uh, opposition um, uh, from common law uh, countries with respect to precaution. So that could be an explanation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, for trying and uh, interesting. I learned a lot. Questions here. Thank you very much. Um, this is tough stuff for scientists <laughs> to swallow. Um, so it means the the precautionary principle, principle, just to make it clear in my head, cannot be legally invoked by third parties. Like if we feel the commission has not followed due diligence and invoked the precautionary principles because we find there is plenty of indication and evidence for adverse effects and EFSA argues against it, for example, and we could settle it in front of court and say, is there enough 
evidence for adverse effects that this should invoke the precautionary principle or not one question and second is there are now discussing the invention of the innovation principle would be your question how would these are you aware of that and and what's your position on that and how would that sort of neutralize I answer firstly to the first question. I just took part in a meeting in Strasbourg uh, on the um, principle of innovation. Um, so my, I'm of the view that uh, uh, the principle of innovation uh, is by a stroke of genius an invention of the French state and the uh, European Commission um, that's running counter precaution. So it's, uh, it has been humbly demonstrated by uh, some observers in Brussels uh, that um, we have a number of uh, undertakings uh, behind, uh, 10 years ago, behind the concept of innovation. Uh, again, from a genuine legal point of view, uh, there is nothing with respect uh, to innovation. There's, it's not a legal principle whatsoever, it's just a policy principle. However, my claim is that a precaution is seriously embedded in German law, in French law, in Belgian law, in Dutch law, uh, through the case law, through the recognition statute, in addition to be enshrined in Article 191 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and also amply endorsed by the Court of Justice. So uh, one cannot place these two principles on equal footing from a legal perspective. From a political perspective, things might be different. Uh, second question, it's a highly complex because it's related uh, to uh, a different uh, procedures. Um, let, let's take a, a very recent illustration. Uh, last week, uh, the Court of Justice had uh, to decide a case, the third case on glyphosate. Um, it was a question that was uh, referred by the criminal court in Poix in southern France, the Court of Justice. It's called preliminary rulings when the national courts, the domestic courts, has doubt uh, as how to apply uh, the legislation which refers questions. Uh, 30 persons were prosecuted by the Procureur de la République for destroying Roundup products uh, in a commune. And uh, before the criminal court, they claim that they had the right to do so on the account that the um, recent inscription of three years ago uh, under the uh, 209-128 regulation on pesticide was running counter the principle of precaution. So the Court of Justice had to decide whether the willingness of the Commission to give five extra years to listing glyphosate uh, the Annex 1 of the 2009 Directive was contrary to the uh, production principle. The answer was that there was no um, manifest error of appraisal uh, on the side of the European Commission. So one was expecting that, but that means that there is a control. So there is a review whether a specific act by the Commission, that review is triggered by the questions referred by the domestic court. Uh, another illustration will be the uh, number of uh, challenges brought by the chemical industries against the listing under the uh, substitution uh, substitute list uh, of the uh, pesticide regulations, uh, the Article 57 of the REACH regulations, and so the claimants, uh, the applicants claim that uh, the Commission uh, is in breach of the principle of preclusion. So there is also a review uh, whether uh, the Commission has not been applying correctly uh, the principal principle. But it will be a completely other story in a forum like in the USA or in Canada. It will be another approach. Yes, thank you very much for, for all of this explanation. And uh, in fact, as I'm coming from France, I was uh, attracted to your last comment about this prejudicial question that has been. Uh, put in front of the European Court of Justice and the reaction of the Court of Justice. According to the French lawyer, and I would like to have your opinion on that, uh, effectively, uh, the Court of Justice said that the Commission has not made something illegal, in a way, uh, with the text, but in the details, it said because the law uh, 
was not again the precautionary principle because in the earlier it asked them not only the active ingredient be tested but also uh, the surfactants, let's say, or the co formulants. And in fact, this is what this is not happening at the EU level. So the conclusion of the lawyer is the law is not illegal, in a way, the law. Uh, takes into account the precautionary principle because of that, but it is not implemented correctly, so there is still space to contest authorization given through this uh, EU directive. And I was curious about your opinion on that. Uh, to, to cut a long story short, uh, there's been ample disagreement among the member states that commit to the G11 in Brussels and South Hamburg regarding the prolongation of the uh, listing of glyphosate uh, three years ago. And finally, uh, Germany shifted its side in November 2017 uh, in deciding to uh, support the inclusion of the prolongation uh, of glyphosate. Uh, the key legal issue is whether uh, the fact of prolonging six months by six months by six months, as the Commission did, was consistent with the 2009-128 uh, regulation or whether it was in breach. And if one looks carefully uh, at the regulation, there is nothing about this kind of uh, football game. When one reach at the end of the football game, it's 0-0, uh, and you will uh, apply a kind of prolongation. I'm sorry, I'm an expert in self soccer. And so uh, the Brussels region, a larger case two years ago before the General Court of the European Union, claiming that the uh, new decisions of uh, November or December 2017 was in breach of the regulation because uh, there was no more period to decide. Uh, the uh, General Court uh, held that uh, Brussels region had no standing because it was not individually affected. So it's a procedural issue, uh, extremely complex. And so apparently the General Court didn't want to uh, tackle the merits of the case. So no standing. So it's still an open question. Uh, but we are coming closer to the end because in two years and a half, uh, the substance is not listed anymore. It's uh, the, the member state decided, uh, contrary to the commission, uh, to authorize glyphosate exclusively for five years, which the proposal of the commission at the outset was 15 years. Hi, uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, I especially liked your, your point on customer use uh, and with reference to the innovation precautionary principle for me, it's, it's kind of obvious how much more politically acceptable an economic argument is to then invoke innovation principle in some senses. Uh, and that's been the real challenge for invoking the precautionary principle in a, in a meaningful way. So, I mean, just in your view, is there a good um, route to, because I'm based in Brussels myself, so building precedent and influencing policymakers to show customary use and to show precedent of this being used in a, an effective and, and useful way. Um, and is there a view for you in terms of how to better enshrine the kind of normative reference of, of precaution in various policies that are being made and to leave this this kind of trail of the principle to then be a basis for customary use, perhaps. Yes. Uh, again, to uh, simplify complex legal topics, uh, two schools of thought. Um, first school I will call uh, precaution spotting. So lawyers claiming that uh, the environmentalist lawyers have just been spotting the notion of precautionary approach, precautionary principles in a wide number of documents. but. That doesn't mean that there is enough state practice to demonstrate that there is a customary rule. Um, the other school to which I belong is to say, hey, come on, that, that doesn't work like this. Uh, a customary rule doesn't require the examination of uh, every litigation, of uh, every statement made by every uh, official in a diplomatic conference. Uh, so one of important is to highlight that there is a consistent approach. And uh, my thesis is that at least uh, in some parts of the world, like Europe, um, the state practice, although it's somewhat inconsistent in some areas, but generally speaking, it's consistent enough. Uh, 
uh, at declaratory, declaratory level, but also at the level of domestic, uh, domestic legislation uh, and at the level of litigation to crystallize precaution into a customary rule. Uh, the, the question is whether the European ex, uh, experience can uh, be applied worldwide, uh, that remains to be seen because um, many in uh, Oceania or um, in Asia, I'm a bit doubtful whether there's really a consistent practice regarding uh, taking into consideration safety. But uh, again, the legal community is extremely divided uh, with respect to these issues, uh, as the courts are. So Idris took everybody by surprise in uh, held it, holding that it was a customary obligation. Yes, question for and, and just one way, where the creation of the international customary law, in a way, similar to, let's say, where the general declaration of human rights, it was soft law to the extreme. And by court decisions in many countries, by uh, legal decisions in many countries, it solidified into something. And of course, in a way, the proportion of principles or approach, as we all say, um, is very new. So, the international solidification into customary law is a very interesting process, and in that process, the EU plays a major role. So, if the EU, in the context of the transatlantic competition, with a sort of sound science principle at the other side of the Atlantic. Um, if it gives in uh, um, castrating the precautionary principles via innovation principles or something, or something else, then the uh, international move towards solidifying into customary international law uh, has a real effect. Yes, um, your statement is correct. It took somewhat like 20 to 25 years to crystallize the principle of the law of the sea uh, into customary rules. And so today it's the 1986 conventions that enshrine uh, these customary rules. Uh, the principle of uh, prevention that's related to, to the no harm principle uh, dating, harking back to the 1941 uh, arbitral uh, decisions uh, in a litigation between USA and Canada regarding um, a cement plant uh, took 40 years for the Shark Court to acknowledge it was a customary rule. So, uh, so there is a long road to who uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, that status. And I think of importance uh, is litigation. So in case you have no uh, litigation coming up before court with both claims, uh, then one is moving into a genuine diplomatic uh, smooth process. And that's, uh, so you have an NGO, a client earth, and a member of the scientific council that's really prompting around the litigation, be it in Poland, be it in London, be it in Brussels, in Paris, wherever, uh, in order to force regulators to take uh, environmental rights much more seriously. So, so of course it makes sense. Um, well, uh, there, there is these, um, the uh, corporate observatory in Brussels that has uh, been conducting research regarding the manipulation of the concept of innovation. So uh, it's a great concept, of course, but uh, the manner in which uh, uh, innovation has been uh, put forward in Brussels, uh, uh, it's really looked like a, a detective novel, <laughs> a fascinating novel. So could be a source of inspiration for authors. Yeah, thanks again to both of the speakers and the audience for the interesting discussion. Thank you very much for your